Indians don't keep quiet easily. We are big communicators. The assumption on power structures are that they're essentially male bastions. I can't think of a single woman who doesn't feel guilty at some point of time. Guilty because you're at work when you're needed at home and you're guilty when you're at home and you're needed at work. Good morning and welcome to Kunba. It's an absolute delight to have you here. What is Nena's recommendation as to how women can navigate power structures? The assumption on power structures are that they're essentially male bastions. The best way that women negotiate these initially is to not see these as glass ceilings. Sometimes we see glass, glass ceilings where actually they don't exist and you sort of bump up against it and find, oh well, it really wasn't there at all. My advice usually is you just do your best. You will be seen for your contribution of what you do at your work and don't get too caught up in this issue of I'm a woman in a man's world because it begins to make you behave in ways that uh, will in fact possibly be detrimental to you. Women are often uh, advised today that they will not push their case enough. So there's a little bit of, hey, I've done my best, I haven't been noticed. We'll not make a pest of ourselves in saying, hey, why have I not been considered, etc. I would see this in just my short journey from my office room to the loo. The men would just be jumping out of the woodwork, trying to track me there to push their case or have a little chat. And the women who could have followed me in there didn't. And I would always tell them, these are the opportunities you must look out for. A third area, you know, the support systems we build. That, and this becomes important because what you have in terms of your boss, your mentors, your friends in the organization and the support system back home are all very critical aspects of the freedom that you push ahead in that power structure so that you are not distracted. But the right organization, but also the right familial and mentorship structures in the organization and outside that help you rise to your full potential. What are two common misconceptions about women in leadership roles that you would like to clarify? I think one of the biggest misconceptions which really bothers me is that women bosses don't help women in the organization. I just don't understand where that comes from. But, you know, I'm, my own experience has clearly been that uh, the women in the organizations I worked in were just such fabulous team members that it wasn't even up for argument. The second misconception uh, about uh, women CEOs is uh, that women tend to be more emotional. Now, I say misconception that women are more emotional, but is a woman CEO or leader more emotional in that role? I think not because you rise to an organization, you've bitten your lip, you've moved ahead, you've processed a lot of situations where when you have to be tough, you're tough. Having managed many prima donnas, how does the CEO give her one downs feedback? The only way is to be frank and free in terms of that feedback. Too many of us duck giving the tough stories. Some of my biggest success stories with my team were those where we sat down and had the heart to heart. At the end of the day, every one of them came back to thank me for the input provided. And these are very tough discussions, very tough for you as a leader. I think the best way is often around a 360 degree process, which is a formal process where inputs are provided from the entire team. So you actually have data. It doesn't sound personal. You present the 360 data not as an evaluation. You do it as a leadership exercise. You don't do it at the end of the year. You do it in the middle of the year. You have the discussion around, look, we are totally appreciated for what you achieve. This is what is standing in your way. The best of these prima donnas actually embrace this. Nena, do you think the world is adopting something from Indian CEOs and Indians on leadership? Many large multinational companies, for example, that have Indian subsidiaries are learning best practice from their Indian subsidiaries to transport them abroad. As leaders, as a people tend to be far more inclusive in the way we work, 
it isn't just about gender and disability. The teams I worked with didn't come from any one part of the country. It was a very mixed group, albeit Indian. So yes, we look like we are one from someone who doesn't understand it as Indian. But in fact, we work with this diversity. I think a second area is uh, we are big communicators. Indians don't keep quiet easily. Meetings are much noisier here than they are certainly in the Asia-Pacific area where I worked. People want to know their space, want to be heard, uh, want appreciation. I think that whole environment is terrific in today's environment where we're looking for innovation, looking for creativity, looking for more ownership of the businesses we run, which can only come from us owning a problem and finding the solutions. Because we are so sensitized to the environment around us, remarkable how many individuals would want to jump onto the bandwagon of what corporate CSR is doing. How does one become a true leader of people? As a good leader, we start by learning from those around us what's working, the bosses that we have liked, even more dislike, what we don't want to be as much as what we would like to be. As a student of leadership, because I just devour information, and by the way, I must thank you guys for putting this whole platform together because it is these sort of platforms that are hugely educative for any of us in leadership positions because they make us reflect on who we are and what we are. I put together a book called 30 Women in Power. It was essentially CEOs, their voices, their stories. It was interesting that almost in unison, leadership traits that stood out were first and foremost humility. And in humility, you would hear and understand from these leaders their desire and ability to continuously learn. A second very important one was dealing with failure. If you don't fail greatly, you're not going to achieve greatly. Typically in my generation, been groomed to think that ambition was bad. But I do believe ambition is not a bad thing. It's important because it helps you and pushes you to achieve. A fourth area, of course, which goes without say, is a passion for excellence. Lastly, goes without say, you have to, at the end of the day, put in that hard work. There are no shortcuts to hard work. What are traits that you are looking for in CEOs today? And what are you measuring them on? So, of course, financial performance is a key one, but it cannot be the only one. A second very key aspect that is emerging is around sustainability. How is that leader setting the KPIs for their team? How is that leader embracing these issues around sustainability? And these issues around sustainability have become important because financial investors that are shareholders in the companies are requiring it. I think a third area is the team. How is this CEO working with the team that reports directly to the CEO, but also how is this CEO seen in terms of being a leader in the organization for the values and the culture that are required? Because a lot of that is about walking the talk. A lot of that is about how top down those value systems permeate the organization. Do you think reverse discrimination is a myth or it's creeping into corporate India? The rules, I think, have to be clear that all things being equal, the woman gets the job. The environment by which you get to all things being equal also has to be considered. So simple things like when you go to hire, if the roster or the group that you're looking at does not have of the four shortlist, one or two women, then you've certainly not achieved the objective of getting women in. But once you've got them in the group, if you hire the guy, I would say that that is not discriminatory behavior. So we have to be careful that we don't hire the woman just for the sake that she is the woman. Nena, how can we address concerns stemming in from men saying that they are losing out to opportunities due to higher focus on diversity? I think men have to also realize that uh, the desire to have the diversity in the workplace comes not just because you want the numbers to show, but because the business model that you look at, the ideation you want, the diverse viewpoints you want, the customer which is often female and you want those perspectives coming in into the organization are key. Men have to also understand where the company is going and women have always said they don't want quota because they worry that if they achieve 
what they've set out to achieve, people point fingers at them and say, hey, you got there because there was a quota, not because you were well and good in your own right. Nena, how do you suggest women in early leadership roles handle the guilt that sometimes comes to meet demands from home, work and family? I can't think of a single woman who doesn't feel guilty at some point of time. Guilty because you're at work when you're needed at home and you're guilty when you're at home and you're needed at work. So it's, it's an issue. I've always described this as the crystal balls of managing and the crystal ball of work, the crystal ball of home and family life. There's a third crystal ball, which is the me crystal ball. The one that likes music and yoga and is what sustains me as an individual. I've always argued that that third me crystal ball is more like a rubber ball. It's one I can let drop, it's not going to shatter, I can pick it up when I have time and work it. But in my book, uh, there were at least five of the 30 who said that for them it was definitely a crystal ball as well. So they have three balls in the air trying to juggle it. And that's what it's about. It's a juggling act. There is no one answer. Managing guilt is therefore about sometimes you veer in one direction because work requires it. Sometimes you have to be home because that requires it. You work with that guilt and try and remind yourself that you shouldn't feel guilty. Surround yourself with people that don't make you feel guilty. One of the pieces of advice I always give young women is don't get into fights with the family. Rally the troops. Make sure that everyone around you is your friend and out there helping you and celebrating your successes. What's a common career piece of advice that you completely disagree with? Do what your heart tells you. Now, the danger of that is it forgets that, yes, you should bear in mind that you work in spaces where you believe you have interest and where your heart is. But you can't always start there. That kind of company may not even hire you. There may be only a small part of the job that is, in fact, about what you enjoy. But there will always be in every job things that you don't want to do. Given your work in sustainability and your role on sustainability committees of boards, what is the role you see for companies in this area? For a listed company, this is not even a negotiation. You have to be able to demonstrate on the one hand that you're not raping the environment, but on the other, that you're actually a leader in the space. And there are all sorts of indices, and more and more movement towards measurement of this which is ensuring that you can't just greenwash, you can't just make statements, you have to show and measure that you are actually on that sustainability path. Nina, can you describe your leadership style and how do you think it was different from your male counterparts? I firmly believed in collaboration, that we were one team, one India, one HSBC. Collaboration, working in teams, and indeed I forced committees and structures that were cross-functional, cross-verticals uh, uh, in order to ensure this. A second one was more communication because with the desire to create this one organization to make sure that we reached out at every level of the organization. And don't forget a lot of this was happening at a time when we didn't have a lot of the technologies that exist today. And a lot of these me meetings ended up being physical and uh, were not that easy to organize. And if you tell someone, hey, these are the values you want, you want to make sure that it's not their interpretation of that value. A third was a firm belief that as an organization, giving back was very important. And I was very fortunate I worked in companies and particularly in my last role at HSBC with an organization that firmly believed in this. So the work we were able to do was about giving back around us, equally creating our internal champions because we did huge programs where we enlisted our own employees to be part of those programs. What's the one thing you wished you knew more of about leading people? What would have helped me was working as I did in multinationals through my career, understanding the many cultural differences that came with working in these multinationals. I had traveled widely, I had a deep interest in different cultures, I'd studied in the US. Given that, it was still not enough to always understand what was required. and. It actually threw me once in a leadership exercise being conducted in Asia, how I was seen as more aggressive than my Asia Pacific counterparts. People from these cultures were far more uh, 
quiet than we are as average Indians, quite honestly. I took away these lessons and yet I would have to do more than that if I was with a Western group. Yeah, now what's your single biggest career achievement that you're most proud of? I'd like to believe that it is about having put teams into place who ended up being the leaders of tomorrow. For every one of the men and women, and I'm particularly proud of the women, they went on to achieve great things. Nena, what's the hardest business challenge you ever confronted? The terrorist attacks happened in Mumbai. And we had 32 people, HSBC employees, stuck in the two hotels at the Taj and the Oberoi. India was, you know, obviously growing. We had visitors from all over. To now look at how we could get each one out, taking decisions which were life-threatening. What advice do you give at each stage is, is very scary. And I was way out of my depth. The leadership lesson I learned was assemble the right team and uh, we got a couple of our global team members who were used to dealing with uh, at least security issues, uh, the India team. So set up a core steering group, very tight, five, six people. And we worked like, you know, three days, not stop, but, you know, in a relay. Yeah, now, do you have a favorite failure of yours? One which uh, I still get reminded about, by the way, by my daughter, is uh, jumping in with answers before I've listened to those around me. And to be always conscious of the fact that if you are the senior person there, you shut people up if you've jumped in before you've shared or heard from others what their inputs are. Nena, what are two traits of a good leader that you wish you had imbibed more of? Very important to be a good listener and uh, to be truly patient when one's listening. The second, to make sure that you make every person feel important. Important for who they are, what they represent, that no idea is stupid. Nena, you know, did you have to navigate male-dominated bastions or power structures in the 90s? And how did you go about it? So once you're in leadership positions, you end up dictating more than being at the receiving end. And it's quite easy to make sure your voice is heard. I think if at all there was an issue uh, felt by me, not necessarily always right on my part, and that's why I talk about the glass ceilings that don't exist, that was in the early part of my career, where I was conscious of the fact that I didn't want to be a pushover. I uh, wanted to make sure I was heard and did have to do a couple of tricky negotiations with a boss to make sure that I was not passed over. Uh, in one particular case, uh, the assumption that I wouldn't take a job because it required moving out of Bombay, which is where I was, because she's not going to be mobile. And I was like, but who are you to decide that for me? If you really believe I'm ready for the role, offer it to me. Let me discuss it at home with the family and come back to you and tell you that I can do it or not do it. Nena, can you walk us through the most formative professional years of your career? Who and what influenced it the most? My father, absolutely a force in my life. He was CEO of an insurance company, so I was very fortunate he understood the world that I was entering. A man of great integrity. I hear such amazing things about him even today for people who worked with him. He's the best tutor ever. Then. My husband, who became the person who enabled me to execute my dream. What's been the most useful leadership advice you ever received? Who did it come from, Nena, and what did they teach you? An executive assistant who came through right after the bombings in uh, Mumbai, where there was a general alert that had gone out that no one was to risk coming to office. I arrive in office uh, as a manager, so I believed I needed to be there to find that she was there. And I'm like, she's left a three-year-old child with a neighbor. She came from miles away and was never going to be able to do it. So I was furious. Why are you here? You know that you should not have taken this risk. And she said, I just knew you might need me. I was like, if this woman can put everything into her work in this manner, who am I to ever think that I'm doing my best. Who is inspiring you today and why? I'd like to believe my daughter. She's 32. She works in the areas to do with in environment, but mainly because she, her friends, are the future. The way they think, the way they work, and in this particular case, the field in which she works in, 
are a great inspiration for me. Nena, who's been the greatest influence on your journey as a CEO or a leader? Indra Nooyi and uh, people like Christine Lagarde, uh, women leaders in terms of uh, how they saw things evolving. If you could trade places with anyone in any industry right now, who would it be and why? Someone like Ila Bhatt for what she stood for. She created the Self-Employed Women's Association. Millions of women through women empowerment programs that have become masters of their own lives. Nena, who is someone you are inquisitive to meet? Who would that be and what would you ask them? Talk further with Ajay Manga, who I do know at the World Bank, to understand how he's going to now reposition the World Bank, which is what is being discussed, and how the future of the World Bank is going to impact the world and humanity. Nena, your quick fire with Kunba starts now. One thing you've learned never to do as a CEO. Be impatient. One thing you've learned always to do as a CEO. Listen. One thing you wish people knew more about you. My love of wildlife and classical music. One leadership practice that you think is most underrated or unused. Collaboration and working with teams. One standout trait that will always get you a job on a board that Nena sits on. Respect for others. One line career advice for women in their first job. Don't see glass ceilings where they don't exist. One thing to keep in mind while managing millennials. To ensure engagement in the organization through community work. One piece of advice never to do managing millennials. Be too dictatorial. A job offer you regret turning down. With a competitor, but no regret because I joined the right organization. Your proudest career moment. When I became CEO of HSBC. The first thing Anna does in the morning, the last thing she does at night. My morning cup of tea, sadly looking at my phone and clearing all my last minute emails and WhatsApp messages. What's been on your personal to-do list for the longest time? To work more in the environment and wildlife spaces. Nena's most prized possession is? My dogs, if you call them possession. Nena Lal's top three upcoming Indian CEOs to watch out for. Uh, Zeroda, uh, CEO Kamath, Naika, uh, Falguni and what she's created. I'd like to see what uh, Invest India does under its new CEO. A women's reservation bill in one sentence. Too long in coming, but wonderful that we have it at long last. Nena Lal Kidwai's legacy will be? To be remembered as someone who cared. If you had a gigantic billboard message out there, what would Nena's message be and why? To work with nature. Nena Lal Kidwai, it's been an absolute honor to have this chat with you. Thank you very much on behalf of Kunda. <laughs> much easier talking about general Others. things. <laughs> the good news is I'm much more nervous than you are. <laughs> so, so. We'll just take a minute break.